Hello, everybody. Welcome to Full Sail University. My name is Mike Orlowski. I'm the head engineer of the dubbing stage. Uh, today, our session will be regarding audio post-production for film and television. Um, please welcome our panelists. First off, David Farmer, award-winning sound designer. You can hear his work on the Lord of the Rings trilogy, The Hobbit, Cowboy vs. Aliens. Colin Hart, he's a course director for the DCBS program, uh, also owner of Heart Effects. Rick Veers, owner of the Detroit Chop Shop and uh, Blast Wave Effects Studios. And Frank Schering, owner of Capital Audio Post. So we wanted to open up this panel today and talk a little bit about the workstations that our, our panelists are using. So if we could go quickly through the panel and just uh, describe what you're working on these days. How quick. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm a Pro Tools guy. I've been using Pro Tools for a long time. And um, probably every plugin, just about every plugin that's available, I pretty much have. Um, I work at home a lot. How, how, much, do you, how much do you want to go? Just like basic, basic stuff? Yeah, we're, we're going to dive just, into your stuff. Okay. Just a okay. Little bit. Um, I'm a Pro Tools guy as well for anything editing to picture or anything timeline based. Uh, recently, within the, I guess the past year, year and a half, I've been using. Uh, Adobe Audition for sound effects editing and mastering. Um, I use, this is where the Pro Tools <laughs> ends and we, the revolution begins. Um, I use uh, Sony stuff, so I'm, uh, everything I cut is in SoundForge. Uh, I use Vegas uh, for uh, you know sound for picture, and then Acid. I use that a lot for uh, sound design creation and sound effect creation. And I use a system called Fairlight. Uh, the software is called Dream, and the controller is a Constellation XT. Okay, so diving into the the work um, workstations that they use, we have we have photos here of of David, Colin, Ricks, and and Frank's. Um, you know, at first glance, they they look at like a, like a typical typical audio post suite, but as we dive into to David's setup. Um, you know, as, as you said that you work in Pro Tools, but I wanted to talk about your use specifically with iPads because you do some, some phenomenal things with iPads. Right. Well, I, I first started off with, um, with V-Control Pro, which is on the right there, um, which is, uh, yeah, this one. And the main reason I like this one is because of the surround panners, which are phenomenal to use. I mean, and, and up until this point, you had to buy like the J.L. Cooper boxes, which are like 1800 bucks a piece. And this is actually, you get two of the panners in one application. And for a lot of the work I do is in surround, you know, when I'm cutting the picture, for, even if it's for a video game, you know, doing the, the little, the little uh, vignettes and, and movies, they all want it delivered in surround. So, you know, it's really hard to pan with a mouse, in my opinion. I mean, uh, particularly since uh, with the stereo track, you can only pan one side at a time with a mouse. This way I can actually pan with, uh, 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 both both sides at once. Sorry, I'm not used to doing this, so it's going to go all over the place. Um, and I started off with this application because it's got a got a Huey side to it as well. The uh, the eight faders act just like a Mackie Huey. It emulates a Mackie Huey, and so you can you can do you can do mixing on it. You can solo and mute and things like that. But there's a this might take a little while to explain, so I'll try to I'll try to speed it up. But basically, I work in premixes, which means uh, we have A through P premixes, and this is so we can keep separation on all the sound effects we want. We start with the hardest sound effects. Not, I don't mean difficulty, I mean things that would sound hard, like an explosion, gunshots, things like that. That usually starts on A, and then you get, it gets softer and softer as you get all the way down to P. And you know, we, we, each one of these premixes is layered up of 32, up to 32 tracks of, uh, of sound effects. And when you're working across, across that much width, that many tracks, it's hard to, you know, you, you, your screen, the tracks are way off the screen, so you can't get down and, and, and solo things, sorry. Solo things. Solo things that you, that, or mute things that you want to solo unless you're actually highlighting the actual tracks you're working on. So what, I, what my session template is set up as is I have VCAs which control the groups for each premix. And then the, the faders are actually, what's showing up on screen is actually the VCAs, so I can solo yeah, that's right. So that's, I can solo or mute each individual premix. Like if I want to just, just hear the guns, I can solo the A's. Or if I want to 
you know, go down and mute some of the other premixes so I can get those things out of the way so I can hear what I'm working on. I can mute the, mute the VCAs and that will mute the underlying tracks underneath. So this has really sped up my workflow a lot. That's, this one right here is, is, uh, is uh, Pro Remote. No, not Pro Remote. Is it Pro Remote? Yeah, yeah Pro Remote. And um, this one allows me to, to have 16 tracks. This application will actually emulate four Hueys at once if you want it to. But uh, the way Pro Tools works is you're allowed four peripherals. So I use two Hueys here, which you're seeing here on the left. And that gives me 16 channels I can solo and mute or mix if I want to do, you know, very broad strokes on the whole premix. And then the, uh, the V control allows me to do the panning. So originally I only had the one iPad and I was toggling back and forth between the, uh, the panners and the, these, this fader pack here. But I, did, I had way too many premixes and I had to swipe over with, with these faders to see the underlying uh, premixes. So I decided to get a second iPad and go to Pro Remote, which I could have 16 tracks on, on screen at once. Does that make sense? Yep. So we're going to move into to some of the, the plugins that are included in Pro Tools. And, and when we were talking and putting this panel together, there was, there was some pretty important stuff that you were, you were focusing on, on the included set and why that's you know, valid and usable in, in, in your workflow. Right. Um, is this on? Is it on? So. Test, test. Um, well, the thing, the thing that's great about Pro Tools now, and when Michael and I were talking about what we would talk about today, I wanted to sort of give you students a, a, a good launching point for you, because you can actually use this at home yourself. Um, this is, these plugins come with Pro Tools, and the one on the left here is Channel Strip, if you're not familiar with it. It's a phenomenal plugin now that has Dynamics EQ, and it's, it's, a, it's a great plugin, and it comes with Pro Tools. So that's the, the, the important thing about that is, if you're shipping a session to, say, a game company, or uh, you know, you're working remotely and you're sh shipping a session to someone else to mix, this plugin will come up. The, you, can, you can have all your favorite plugins in the world, but if you ship your session to somebody else and they don't have that plugin, then all the work you've done is lost. So the important thing about these, and the cool thing about these is it just comes with your Pro Tools install, so if you ship your session somewhere else, it will, it, all your work will, will open up with your session. And you know, the, the, the big tricks in sound design are not really, not really secrets. You low end and reverb. <laughs> That's really, you know, 90% of it. And some decent reverbs come with Pro Tools. The air reverb's pretty good. The D-verb is not bad. Uh, I know lots of people that, that use it. You can certainly put it on a bus and, 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 and send to it and get decent reverbs out of it, particularly if you put an EQ following it. And uh, the EQ3 down there at the bottom is the little one. That's, that was out before Channel Strip came out. That's a free uh, EQ that comes with it. Sounds really good. And a lot of the tools that you want, that you want to do sound design with, you can actually do. I mean, you're, believe me, if you, if you do this for a living, you're never going to stop buying plugins. I, I, I keep thinking I'm done, and then I'll wind up spending three grand more on plugins you know, over a period of a couple months. Now, these, this, this series of reverbs is something I just found on The Hobbit. Uh, some, some friends told me about it. And I was absolutely blown away by these reverbs. And they're, they're super cheap. They're 50 bucks a piece. Well, Valhalla Room and Valhalla Vintage Verb are outstanding reverbs. And Valhalla Ubermod is, uh, does chorusing and flanging sort of things. And I'm usually not a big fan of flanging and chorusing. I think it sounds pretty artificial pretty quickly. But this one is an amazing one. And I actually even used this on Warg vocals just to give them a little bit of movement, and it didn't sound fake. But, but I want to talk about Valhalla Room a little bit, because this, this is, a, is my new favorite reverb. I hate to say that, because uh, there's so many great verbs out there. Uh, Altiverb, of course, is the, is the king of, of reverbs, and it can uh, emulate other verbs. But, you know, Altiverb can be a little bit of a DSP hog in your session, and the problem with Altiverb as well is if you're shipping sessions between two people, you've got to have your IR impulse folder has to be the same on both ends. On Hobbit, we had a, we had a server-based IR folder so that everybody that, was, everybody that opened a session inside Park Road Post would pointing at the same IR folder. So if you ship sessions then to, between people, it would open up and, and reference the same IRs. But if, if I send my session here or to some of my other clients, they won't have the same IR folder, so the, so the Altiverb automation won't, won't come up. But these are, these are just straight DSP reverbs, so if, if, the, if the other person has it, they open the session and the, and the settings just come up. They're very low DSP usage, 
They sound phenomenal, and they, they're running RTAS, audio units, and VST. So they run across all kinds of platforms. I highly recommend these. And this is a plugin mix. This is a whole package of plugins, and I'll, I'll say that they're, they're, they're not my favorite plugins. They, they're, they do a lot of different things. They do coursing, flanging, all kinds of things. The reason I sort of in, include this as a must-have set for students and people starting off is because they run in demo mode forever without any beeps or pops or anything like that. You can't, you can't recall the settings, so you, you close the session and reopen it, the settings won't recall and you can't automate them, but you can use them to, to modulate sounds or distort them or do whatever you want. You can get sounds through these as a demo, you know, and eventually you'll, you'll find the ones you like and you, you'll wind up buying them. But the reason I think these are kind of critical is because they will run forever for free and you can actually dig in and play around with them. Now these are two plugins that if you're going to be doing surround mixing for film. I, I, don't, I don't usually recommend if you're doing stereo sound design, like if you're sending files to a game company or, or just creating sounds for a library. I usually don't recommend that you, that you embed uh, subharmonic information in stereo files. Um, you, you know, that, that's not a global statement, but I usually don't recommend that that gets done. These are both uh, subharmonic gener generators that generate frequencies down in the, sub, in the subwoofer range. And what these are great for is if you're doing surround bounces or mixing in surround and you want to bust to a sub so you can actually hit the sub discreetly, these are, these are both very good plugins. They both do, about the, they both do the same thing, so you, know, you, you can get one or the other. And they both run in VST and audio units and RTAS. Now, McDSP is one of the companies you want to keep your eye out for. If, you, if you're not familiar with them yet, they make phenomenal, phenomenal plugins. And this particular package here, the Project, Project Studio, is great for students. It's 79 bucks, I think. And the ML1 limiter that comes with this is worth the price of that alone. That's, it's a phenomenal limiter. It's much better than the channel strip limiter that came, in, came with Pro Tools. But this one doesn't run in VST. It runs in audio units and RTAS. But this is a great set of plugins with uh, analog saturation, EQ. Uh, it's even got a convolution reverb in there, sort of like a mini alta verb. Highly recommend this, too. Now, I may be jumping the gun on Alloy 2 a little bit. I, I, I just bought this. I, I, I wasn't using Alloy 1, and I always would go look at Isotope. Isotope makes great products as well. But I, I had skipped buying Alloy because every time I looked at it, it had, it, it had tools that I figured, I thought, hey, I've already got those. I've already got limiters. I've already got EQs. I've got all this stuff. But I saw a demo of Alloy 2, and the thing that I like about this is that yellow line you see there. You can... You can it will actually show you a graphic display of what you're doing to the sound dynamically. Like if you're using the transient modulator, you can crank it up. You can see that yellow line will jump and show you exactly what you're doing, and you can have like your release times. You can see when it snaps back. And I know you're supposed to use your ears. Obviously, you're supposed to use your ears, not your eyes. But this was such a great tool, and it teaches you what you're doing because half the time you're tweaking these knobs and you know you don't you sort of I know what this is supposed to be doing in theory but what's it doing and you're trying to trying to figure out what's what's going on and you get a graphic display of what's happening and you can kind of figure out like the first the first thing I tried the demo on was with a with a machine gun and I could see that when I was adjusting the transients I was hitting the transients too hard and I didn't have the decay coming off in time so that it wasn't snapping back for the next fire of the gun but with you, if you use this display, you can actually have the peaks popping out and you can adjust the release time so that it, it snaps back in time so it actually catches and, and, and gets the next part of the gun. I just think it's phenomenal. Now, Quick Keys, this is one of these things that not only for Pro Tools, every other aspect of your Mac life, you, you'll, you'll, you can really get to shortcuts. You can call up plugins. You can have presets in your plugins. You can type... type um, values in your plugins, and uh, this is a real time saver, and I think it's part of the reason I like Macs over PCs is actually this, is the fact that Quick Keys exists. And I just, I probably have a thousand Quick Keys that I've made over all the different applications trying to get, trying to speed up my workflow, but I also recommend this highly. Now Odyssey is, is, a, is sort of a new thing I'm trying out. I kind of like to try out uh, new technologies, and there's a, there's a lot of different, this is, this is great for students, I have to say. I'm actually using this, at, giving this a try at home myself. The Odyssey, I believe, is made by, is a company made by Tom Holman. Um, don't quote me on that, but somebody told me that he had created it. 
And it, it's, it's a system that with, you, with your home stereo system, you set up a microphone in the, in the middle of the room or wherever you're sitting, and it will, it will send sweeps through all the speakers. It will figure out how far the speakers are from where the microphone is, make adjustments, figure out how big the speaker is, sort of set up a little e, uh, EQ in there. And, and, but the most important thing for me is it will phase up the speaker so that everything is hitting, hitting your ear at the same time. Because I can't tell you how many times I've sat down at people's workstations and, and the speakers were just not in phase with each other. The center would be too close to them, the left, the right would be over here. And people just don't tend to think this way when they sit down at a 5-1 workstation. If you, take a, if you take some pink noise and you pan it around the room, you'll just hear it go And it shouldn't be doing that. It should sound like the noise should be consistent all the way around. You shouldn't pan it between the center and the left and hear a, it shouldn't sound like really phasey and stuff like that. So Odyssey, is, is a great way of, for, for home surround use, uh, getting into the, into the receiver and having your speakers phased up. Now the problem with it is you've gotta have, you've gotta go into it digitally. So I originally tried a home receiver that had Odyssey in it and, and the Odyssey wasn't processing on the analog inputs at all. And there's no way to get out of Pro Tools through a DTS stream or an AC3 stream. But now, there's a, I'm trying to box through, through Mark of the Unicorn, or the HD Express, which allows me to output from Pro Tools over HDMI, and I can do up to 7.1 out of, out of Pro Tools, straight into the Odyssey receiver, and I can do 7.1 at home this way. Thank you very much, David. Um, we're gonna continue on with mobile recording. We have two experts here on the panel. Um, Rick, for one, having the, the largest amount of sound effects libraries commercially available uh, to the public, um, and Colin, who is specialized in and, and more of a, a boutique uh, offering of, of sound design elements, um, but both of them, um, through, their, through their websites, um, allow sound designers like David, um, editors and mixers and designers like Frank to, to purchase these sound effects that they need um, on, the, on a project by project basis, or, or even to an, make an initial investment to, to start your, your own sound effects library by purchasing like a large bundle um, that Blastwave offers. So um, I wanted to talk briefly about what, what is your go-to recorder? Um, you know, um, I know Colin, you, you do things, um, you know, on, on, on like a small to a large scale depending on the project, but you know, just on a day-to-day -day thing, what, what recorder do you have all the time. Um, my go-to recorder is the 702 uh, by Sound Devices um, <clears throat> because it's, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it's really easy to use. There's, there's not a big learning curve and I know it so well now that I don't even really have to think about it. Um, and I'm never worried about the sound of the recorder. I'm never, you know, worried about, well, you know, am I going to have a noise floor on this and can it handle a sound this loud? It just has a really good um, handle of, of pretty much anything I want to record. Um, the only drawback, it has two channels. I can't do anything more than that with that recorder, but um, most things I record aren't going to need more than that. Rick, what do you, what do you take with you? Uh, I've got several recorders. I've got the, uh, the Tascam, the HS, what is the P82, which is the 8-track. That, mm -hmm. That's a little bit more of a larger recorder, so I'll take that with me and throw it on a cart if I'm doing like a gun setup or something where I need multi-tracks. Um, 99% of the time, I'm just doing stereo stuff. So I'll just bring a two-track recorder. Usually I use the, uh, the Fostex FR2. Um, we have some LEs, and then, you know, for smaller things like uh, covert operation stuff, I'll take, like, the DR40 or a Zoom recorder and, you know, a little handheld stuff and stick them in places you can't normally go or I want to get crowd walla or something and I don't want to, the crowd to know that I'm walla them, I guess. <laughs> right. um, I'll just take it with me, so, yeah. Frank, do you have a, a rig that you use at Capital Audio Post if you get the chance to go out? Um, my partner Chip has, uh, I believe it's a Tascam two-track, but I don't personally have anything. Um, back at MVI, we used to have uh, a Shure mixer, I can't remember what it was, and then it was going to, I can't remember what the recorder was, with uh, Shep's mics. Now, David, you were kind enough to, to send us some photos of, of the rig that you take with us. You're a big fan of the Sony M10. I am. I'm kind of the poster boy for these little <laughs> these, these little recorders here. And uh, I, have a, I have a sound devices too. It's not like yeah, I don't have I these. <laughs> but uh, this little recorder here, I, 
is, is about, it's 240 bucks. When I first bought my, my first one, I have several now, um, it was $189. And usually technology like this goes down in price, but the fact that this, that this M10 has gone up to about 240 bucks, it tells you that it's, it's a successful unit and it sounds really good. It's got built-in Omni mics. Uh, I have a, a ton of things I could say about this. It, I use it a lot. I have to say about 90%, at least nine times out of ten, if I'm going to record something now, I just use this because it sounds great. It's easy to use, and, uh, and it, you can use it with one hand, and it, it record up to 96K, 24-bit. It's a phenomenal little recorder. I just can't say enough about it. I recommend everybody has one. Uh, the Gorillapod, yeah, forget the cameras there. <laughs> but uh, this, is, uh, this attaches to the M10 or any of the little portable recorders you get. You know, have a, have a camera tripod mount on it. This just allows you to use it hands-free. You can hang it on a fence. I've done that dozens of times. Just you know, we we did some tiger recording for Hobbit, and I, just, I hung my M10 on a gorilla pod on the on the fence because the, the tigers were inside of a cage, a chain link fence thing. We just hung the recorder right on the on the fence, and, and it's you know just allows you to use it hands-free. Now the Zoom H4n. I know lots of people love these, and I do recommend it. It's not my favorite recorder, but it's pretty noisy. It's uh, the, the zooms, in my opinion, and it's my opinion. You know, I'm not going to. I'm not far be it for me to tell somebody else what to do, what what what, what to use. Uh, I just find them to be a little noisy, especially the onboard microphones. I feel like there's a high end EQ built into it somehow. I mean, the first the first recording I made with mine, with the onboard mics, was an unfair test. It was it was rain on a tin roof, which is you know obviously pretty tinny. Uh, but it, it, I did not like the sound of it. I thought it was way too bright, and I haven't had good success with it on, with its onboard microphones. However, for for two hundred and seventy dollars, it does have XLR phantom powered inputs. So if you want to use a, a better microphone like Sheps or Sennheiser or something like that, it does allow you for for a fairly good price to get out and, and use your better microphones. All right. So, what what kind of advice can you give to to our group today as far as um you know, you have these recorders. Goal is to have these, you know, accessible with you on a day-to-day -day basis. But um, when you're when you're going out to record, you know, your, maybe your first sound effect. You know, you just take the thing out of the box, got batteries in it, you're ready to go. Um, what would you suggest? First thing you do, and uh, to to get you know into the groove of recording your own sound effects. Um, I would say the the biggest key for me is just listening. Um, I mean, throw some headphones on and throw your recorder into, into record and move it around. It's, it's all about placement, microphone placement, what it's going to sound like. And, uh, you know, you, you have, uh, usually in your head, you have an idea of what you want to hear, what you want to accomplish, and just move the, the mics around until you find the closest to what you want. Um, it's um, uh, one of the things I do, I often close my eyes when I'm trying to record because... Um, a lot of times the, mic, the best mic placement doesn't make sense. You know, sometimes you're just moving the mic around, you're like, oh, it doesn't sound the way I think it should. And then you end up way over here, and it's like, I have no idea why that sounds good, but it does. So. What about you, Rick? Yeah, no, it's the same thing as it's experimentation. You just, you just play. I did um, just talking about, it's finding the, the source of the sound. Mm -hmm. um, a couple years back, there was a blizzard that hit Detroit. And uh, so I went out immediately, you know, and went out to the woods and um, freezing cold. I spent like three and a half hours in the woods. The trees were just rocking back and forth in the snow. And we actually got a tree fall, natural tree fall, which, uh, yeah. Um, which scared the bejesus out of me because I got my headphones on and I got it cranked up and all of a sudden I hear, <laughs> and I'm like, I totally thought the tree was going to fall on me. But um, at any rate, so I'm I, was after, I was trying to capture just whistling wind and I was getting gusts of wind through the trees and some interesting stuff, but I really wasn't asked for that, you know, the quintessential, you know, whoosh, 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 you know wispy wind. So um, after I had to uh, amputate my second toe from frostbite, I decided to leave the woods. Um, but I always have the rule of whenever I move from one spot to other, I always leave the recorder engaged and I always have my headphones on because I don't know what I'm going to accidentally run across. So I get all the way back to the car and I'm like, I'm done, I'm frozen, I'm just going to call it a day. I set the mic down, I went to the bag, and as soon as I set the mic down, and, and it, they scared me at first. I'm like, where is this coming from? And I'm looking around, and my, my mic's just pointed at the car, and it's, 
And I'm like, what the heck? But it just so happened, uh, fortuitously, I guess I stuck the mic right by the, my hatchback where the crack is. And I just got that sweet spot where the wind was wishing, you know, whipping around. If you take your headphones off, you don't hear anything. But it was just right where that was. So I'm like, oh, man, because I, I couldn't, like, pass it up. So I had to stay out there for another half an hour and amputate another toe. Um, but we ended up, I recorded, like, I don't know, probably another 10 or 15 minutes there. And then, of course, I had to go around every little crack in the car to see if there was any more. But it was just that the way the wind was blowing, the way the position of the car was, and everything just kind of worked out. So it's just a matter of, um, like Colin said, it's not... It's not where you, it's never where you think the sound is going to come from. It's usually like a little bit off or a little bit above it or below it or so. You just experiment and kind of find where it's at. David, what, what do you have to Yeah, um, I have a little bit of a different approach. I'm not going to argue with any of this because these guys are experts. And, but I, I do something that, that not many people do. And I'm, not even, I'm not even sure I recommend it, but uh, I don't record with headphones on. And it, what they're saying is absolutely true. And Ben Burt used to, used to find sound effects the exact same way. Put a microphone on headphones on and look around, go walk around looking for sound effects. If you don't know who Ben Burt is, sound, Star Wars, Raiders of the Lost Ark, he's like the reason we're all here, you know? <laughs> um, so he's amazing. Uh, but I found a long time ago that I started getting better recordings myself by not using headphones because I can hear, I, I, I can hear in the real environment where the sound is coming from. I'll give you one example of where headphones doesn't work. Um, we were recording some, some possums. They had a research facility of possums in New Zealand, and, and we were in there at night. It was dark. We couldn't see where they were. And the, the, the guys were, the things would screech. But the guy, everybody that had headphones on, they had the shotgun microphones, when the things would screech, they had no idea where the thing was coming from because it could come from anywhere in the building. So it may be behind them. But, the, but you, can't tell, you can't tell where a sound is coming from on your headphones. You, can't, you don't know how to localize where it is because your microphone is here and you don't, you don't know. So, you know, if I, it, I, I was the only one without wearing headphones and I could pop my microphone straight to where the thing was, was screeching. But everybody else was like hunting around trying to figure out where it, was, where it was coming from. So if you don't use headphones, you can find the sound. In my opinion, you can find the sound a whole different way. You have to, you have to sort of get used to knowing where to point your microphone, and you, you, you'll, you'll screw up. You'll, you'll miss sounds this way, too, because you won't be monitoring, and all of a sudden you realize, oh, your recorder wasn't running, or something like that. But we're, we're, not recording, we're not recording dialogue in sync with video or film. So if we miss it, in my opinion, okay, if we miss it, that's okay, you know, occasionally. Because uh, in, in my experience, I've gotten better results by not wearing headphones. So... <laughs> Picture of a camera here. This was an uh, interesting story that, that David was telling me as far as, you know, what do you, and a perfect example of, you don't have the, the Sony M10 yet, you don't have a recorder, um, but you, you have a, a camera or your, or your iPhone, uh, and he, he sent us this video. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, well, this was, in, this was in Wellington, New Zealand. My wife and daughter had come over to visit, and we went to the zoo, as you do. And normally I have my M10 with me everywhere I go, because you never know where you're going to come across a sound. This day I happened to forget it. The only thing I had with me was this, this Panasonic camera. And I just whipped it out and recorded this lion, and it turns out I'm using, doing wargs and other things for the movie. I needed lots of lions and big cats, and I have lots of, lots of lions and big cats recorded at 192K, 24-bit, the best mics, the best rigs, but none of the recordings I had from commercial libraries or, or, or my own stuff had the character I, I really was after, and I came across this sound that I had recorded with this camera, and it had exactly what I, what I wanted. So I used it several times in the movie, and we can show that. So, 
so yeah, the, the point there is, you know, if, if, if you miss the recording, it's just gone. You know, whatever you record it with is better than recording it with nothing. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to start a rumor that I only go out and record my sound effects with a, with a point and shoot camera. But, and I'll leave the, you to be the judge of whether those sounds were cinematic or not. I thought they actually came out pretty good. It wasn't like I used them raw, I processed them up, you know, and I used RX to clean it up and get the kids screaming out of the recording and stuff like that. But it, 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 the, the character of the source was what really made it work. It wasn't the, it wasn't the gear. Okay. So the, the libraries that, that, that we all keep as, as, as editors, um, you know, are very vital to the, the success of our career. It's our, our palette that we have to you know, to work with, and it's because we have these sounds that we're able to, to create these interesting environments. Um, I'm very interested of how you're, you're actively storing it, not necessarily organizing at this point, but just how do you store and how do you transport your library from, from gig to gig? So we'll just kind of start from left to right. Well, I store mine on, on, on a three terabyte drive that's password protected, so if somebody, if I drop it or somebody steals it, they can't get at it. <laughs> Um, and yeah, just a fire. It's just, just a FireWire three terabyte drive. And then, as far as the backups, how many? I keep, I keep at least two copies. I keep one mirror of that drive at home, and I keep another mirror of that drive in a safe deposit box. And I, I also keep a disk image on on my main system every night. Every night at 10 p.m., it scans my drive for any new files since the last time I put the drive in a safe deposit box. And then that, that disk image then gets scanned by this program called Backblaze, which stores it to a cloud so that it uploads every night. So it, it, if, some, if my house burns down or somebody breaks in and steals my computer, uh, the theory is I can go to the bank, get my, my library drive out of the bank, then download anything newer from Backblaze cloud uh, storage, and I can basically have it. You know, often, absolutely updated. How often do you take that drive out of the bank to just update? About it? two every two months or so. Every two months. Yeah. Colin, um, <clears throat> I don't have a safety deposit box yet, <laughs> um, but I also keep mine on a three terabyte drive. I just upgraded that um, to an eSATA um, just because I was having speed issues, but. Um, I keep a backup uh, on my computer and uh, a mobile backup as well. Um, I usually keep one off-site, um, at least, but um, it's not quite as elaborate, but I'm working on it. <laughs> Rick? Um, I have, I back up everything, usually in triplicate. Uh, I put them in different places. I usually give uh, some to some friends to store at their places, at their house or whatever. Most of them don't even do sound design, so they're like, what's this box do? So they're not going <laughs> to, it's like 400,000 sound effects on that drive. And they're like, yeah, okay. They stick it in their closet. Um, but I, I, I keep everything on, um, I eat just constant, constant backups. Um, especially doing mobile recording, the first thing I do when I get back is I make two copies of it before I even wipe the card or whatever I record it on. So immediately I bring it into my machine, from the machine it goes to a backup, then I take the original recording and then burn it to a DVD, So because the DVD won't ever, you know, the drive won't ever go out of it, supposedly. It'll last for hundreds of years or whatever. Uh, and then I'll wipe the card. So before I even turn off the machine, I've already got three copies of whatever it is I just went and recorded. Because I've had, unfortunately, experiences where you just spend like the perfect day gathering all these sorts of things and then you accidentally wiped a card or somebody didn't realize it and grabbed it and wiped it. So the first thing I do before I even put the machine away is I make sure I've got three copies of it. Yeah. Frank? Well, apparently I don't do enough <laughs> compared to these guys. Um, you want to store some of my sound effects uh, for me? <laughs> yeah, uh, gladly, on my server. <clears throat> we, uh, we store our stuff on a sound effects server that is accessible by all of our rooms. And um, I don't know, it's a six or seven terabyte server. I don't know how many we have on there. Backups, we have UL tape. And then if it's something we purchased from a library like these guys, if we had a disk, then we have the disk backup as well. But I guess I need to get a safety deposit box or, <laughs> or something. Store it on a camera. <laughs> so, in, in addition to needing to store it, I mean, the, the ultimate goal is, is finding it, you know, um, at that, that moment. You know, you, you recorded the sound effect of the line on the camera, you got it in, you clean it up, it's stored in your library. But then when the film calls for it, 
you need to remember what you named it, where it was stored, where it was located. Um, and, and although he's probably not going to be happy that I'm bringing this up, David saw the need of this back in, in the, the late 90s and, and built his own sound effects search engine using um, FileMaker Pro as a back end and some Apple scripting. And, and he's not a, a program coder, but he just figured a need of, of creating this library engine that, that, that editors could use. I purchased it myself. A number of people in Hollywood were buying it. Um, and then uh, I think once you got on Lord of the Rings, it, it kind of went away. You were, you were really busy. It went away as fast <laughs> as possible, yeah. Um, so I, I wanted to start with you to talk about your you know, organization and, and the, you know, the replacement that I think most of us have moved over to, uh, which is SoundMiner. Yeah, I was very happy when SoundMiner came out because <laughs> <laughs> I no longer had to support this uh, database system. I felt guilty about, about you know, basically you know, cutting, it, cutting everybody off. I kept it going as long as I could. But there were things in SoundMiner that I was unable to do in FileMaker, you know, um, like having the waveform down there and being able to alter the pitch while you're listening to it. Uh, and the, the great thing about SoundMiner, in addition to its search engine and, and auditioning capabilities, is it has a VST rack that you can, uh, so you can have a, a rack, I think it's 10 slots, 10 slots of plugins, uh, and you can save a preset uh, of your plugins, and it, it will it'll recall the bypass state of the plugins, the actual settings, so you can, you can put some limiters, EQs, reverbs in there, you can recall the whole rack, and it'll, it'll, it'll call the whole thing up. So I have a few favorite racks of mine, you know, sort of go-to settings for you know, compression and, and bigulating things and stuff like that. And I, I would say probably about 90% at least of the processing I do to a sound to, to make it cinematic, in my opinion, cinematic, is done right in SoundMiner. And, and I, when I spot the sound into Pro Tools, all those effects are baked into the sound already. Uh, I, I can't undo it at that point. You've got to be a little bit ballsy to commit to the process, but that's just the way I like to do it. Colin? Um, I currently use uh, NetMix, which I can't stand, but um, <laughs> it works uh, for now. Um, uh, I only have about 70,000 sounds, I think, to, to search through, but um, it helps me find what I need in a... In a relatively quick manner. Um, you know, it reads all sorts of metadata and it, it'll drop right into Pro Tools. Um, I don't have waveform or uh, VST plugin capabilities, but, um, uh, but I do most of that in, in Pro Tools or Audition anyways. So as a big purveyor of sound effects, you know, program like SoundMiner is vital because you're capturing the sound and, and also are the author of what is this sound so that if I buy your library, I, I can search for what I think the sound needs to be and, and we, we almost have to be in sync. So how are you using SoundMiner to, to make that, that happen for, for your customers? Well, I, I would say SoundMiner is the tool which is half the battle. I just need to figure out a way to, for me, it's uh, rather than the access, it's for me to um, actually embed the metadata. So I, I'm at the beginning of the chain where it's like, okay, I just got a WAV file with no metadata whatsoever. I got to tag this file. So then I've got to create some kind of a system that I think these guys are going to use. I don't know what he's thinking or what he's thinking. So I got to try to figure out words that I think they're probably going to look for uh, when they're looking for whatever sound it is they're after. So then I use SoundMiner to embed the metadata. But really for me, the battle is, okay, what is this sound? Is this, uh, you know, is this an impact? Most of the stuff is pretty easy. You know, this is an impact. This is an ambient sound. This is a whatever. Um, but then there's like some sounds, it's like, ah, yeah. It's cool. <laughs> I have no idea. So um, this, the, we just did Sonopedia 2.0 uh, about a year or two ago, and we actually just I just created a new category, category, and I said I quit. It's, just, <laughs> it's called textures, and it's just you know we we did some recordings of some palm. What are they called? Frongs. Yeah. Frong, palm frongs, um, and some other different you know vegetables and fruits and just kind of weird textures. Some of them were metallic and wood and stuff. And it's like I have no idea what it is, but it's useful. It's very useful, but I don't know what to call it. It's a texture. And then I'm like kind of starting that new category there. So, Frank, what are you using to find sound effects? We use. Um, on the Fairlight, there's a function built in called Audio Bass, which is very similar to SoundMiner. It does not have the pitch function, which I will be calling them and asking them for that, though. That seems like it's very handy. 
and the plugin function. But it, the thing about audio base is it allows us to write in the timeline instead of going outside, we can just pop it up and we can audition the time, the sorry, the sound in the timeline, and you can jog it back and forth and place it exactly where you want, and it's instantly in there. And then you can import in the background while you work. So it's it's very fast. One more thing I want to add to yeah. this. Um, the, the, I just thought of when they were talking. The, the great thing about having the VST rack and the pitch function in, in SoundMiner, particularly if you if you have a reverb in your in your plugin chain, is you can hear what the sound is going to sound like through the reverb as you're pitching it. And sometimes when you're pitching it, that's that's the really crucial thing is trying to figure out if going up is better, or going down is better, and exactly how much you're pitching it. You don't just blanket go, okay, I'm going to pitch it down 12 semitones. Mm -hmm. You may you may noodle around with down to seven minus five. And you can hear what the sweet spot is and exactly how it's going to sound like through the reverb. Otherwise, you've got to bring it into Pro Tools, pitch it, then try it through a reverb in Pro Tools, then re-record it if you want to embed it. Right here, it's really fast to find the sweet spot of your sound. And that reverb is baked in when you bring it into yeah. Pro Tools? Yeah. It's either, it's either baked in or I'll, I'll turn the reverb off. If I, if I don't think the mixer's going to like hearing that on there, I'll, I'll turn it off and, and I'll, I'll, it, I'll spot one file in that's completely dry. And then I'll spot another one in right next to it that's come, that is 100% wet. So then they have, uh, they can have it. both sounds are right next to each other. So the the next step of our discussion is is Capital Audio Post. Frank, you're the the owner. Of, this is your your new baby, and uh, Frank is, um, you know, it seemed like the odd one out where it's a Pro Tools, Pro Tools, and then Sony and, and Fairlight. And Fairlight is is a pretty interesting editorial and mixing platform and it, it's I don't think it's showcased as you know as much as avid products and uh, and I think you guys are in for a real treat to, to listen to Frank kind of talk about you know his workflow and and how he uh, kind of masters the fairlight well, yeah they definitely don't get the uh, the publicity or, or credit or whatever that they deserve um, I'm not going to knock Pro Tools, you know, especially when everyone in here would gang up on me. Um, well, except for him. We're, we're the outsiders. But it's a really great platform. Um, that picture there is my partner Chip's room. Um, and he and I have the same uh, setup, essentially. Um, you can see there that his uh, center channel speaker is not placed there because he had been working on stereo only projects and so he just pulled his center channel speaker out and put some uh, oratones in there for some uh, crappy near field sounding NS10-esque uh, mix check. But uh, the Fairlights that we have, um, I, and now yesterday if you were listening to me talk I think I said 144 channels but that may be wrong but I think it's 144 channels and uh, 56 buses. Um, unlike Pro Tools, now, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages, but one of the disadvantages for me or anyone using the Fairlight compared to Pro Tools is in Pro Tools you can have as many tracks and buses as your processor can handle, correct? Yeah. In the Fairlight, it's what you buy is for a license, you know. Now, granted, for the type of work that we do, reality TV, documentaries and stuff like that, we're not going to have 300, you know, tracks of sounds. So what we have with 144 channels is, is great. It works great. And uh, the editor of these things is phenomenal. Um, the little edit section is uh, called the binnacle. And basically it's just, you got a little jog wheel, and then you have your edit functions around the jog wheel. So you can sit there and with one hand switch back and forth between copy, cut, erase, fade, trim, slip, however. And then with your left hand, you can tell what you want to do. You want to cut the head, cut the tail, cut the clip, however you want to do. And I know uh, Pro Tools just introduced it, but Fairlight's had real-time fades, you know, forever. And so you could be playing along and go, oh, I want to fade here, bump done, you know. And uh, there's a lot of other really uh, time-saving things that it has. Um, rendering sounds, I can render, you know, a whole show worth of, you know, a thousand clips, you know, in two minutes. You know, processing time, and uh, it's—I I just think it's incredible. It would take me probably three hours to sit down and kind of go through all of the, you know, the functions of it. But do you do you know if 
a fair light has any intention of making like just the the software only editor that you can at least start maybe on a, on a, on a laptop and or and then get into the controller yeah. later. I know the controller <laughs> is so vital to the way that the Fairlight works. And right. there's, there's been a, a long-standing debate, uh, even, even when I worked in LA, where the, the dialogue editors were on Fairlight MX3 systems, and we were on, on sound effects, we were on Pro Tools, um, and uh, Foley was cut on Fairlight. And there was, there was always like a standing challenge from the dialogue editors that would say, any Pro Tools editor, any time, any place, anywhere, Take the same project and cut it, and whoever was on the Fairlight would would be done faster because it's it is a machine built, you know, for for editing. And now that they've included the the mixing side of it as well, it's becoming more of the complete package. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as far as the software goes, I don't remember what it's called, but it was late last year they came out with a software only version that. The real key to the new, I'm going to sidestep here, the real key to the new Fairlight systems is their processing card, the CC1. But with the software-only version, it basically takes your processing in your PC or laptop or whatever you have and emulates that CC1. Um, as far as I know, it's not for sale. I think their goal was to use it as like a student thing here. You know, let's give this to, for free to students so they can learn on it and then move up from there, but I don't know where they're going with that now. I, I don't know if they're going to actually put it out. But I'm, I'm sure when that does happen, Frank oh yeah, be, I will let you know. <laughs> there will be emails coming down. I keep it. pushing it. So we'll take a look uh, a little bit about the, uh, the the mix kind of window. I know it's kind of difficult for you to see. Yeah, no, I can't really see it, but that's okay. It doesn't really matter. Um, the mix window is just like mix window of of uh, Pro Tools, you know. You can do anything you want with a mouse. You can do it with the controller. You know, it's mm -hmm. there's the one thing I like about the Fairlight is there's like three or four ways to do everything. So if you have one way that's faster for you, you can do that. And anything that you can touch on a controller, you can write a macro for. So you can hit one button and run through you know a hundred processes just so you're, like you're that. doing the same thing that, that David's using the quick keys right for, for quick the keys Mac. yeah you're, you're making um, right you talk, talk about some of your main macros that you've, you've the, used well the one that I use the most is for uh, voiceover placement in in the documentaries and stuff so I have a macro written where I hit one button and it takes the machine control offline so it takes a picture offline it jumps to the next clip selects from there to the end of the project cuts all the clips brings it back places it in the timeline, puts machine control back on, backs up five seconds in place. So I just hit boom, and it's, okay, that's where I want it to go, that's where I want it to go, and it just jumps and grabs it and drops it right in. So you can just speed through dropping the, the VO in. I mean, it's in a rough placement, because then you're going to tweak it as you're, right. as you're you doing there. sound design, right. But it's you know, very fast, and with three or four or five days to get these shows done, every second counts. So mm -hmm. you know, But there's uh, you know, three or four ways to do anything you want, I personally don't use the mouse to do anything. I use the buttons because I like touching faders and knobs and blinking lights. They dazzle me. <laughs> so how? So we have we have two Pro Tools editors, Sony and Fairlight. How are you sharing your work together? So if you're collaborating on a project, you know uh, we have two people on Pro Tools. How are we sending the the work back and forth between each other? If I'm collaborating on a project with David. I will find any way possible <laughs> to transfer it. Wait, I want to work with David too. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to create a new software to do. No, the like for the Fairlight, you can do OMF, AAF. Um, you can ex you can bounce files and export those. You know, mix down to whatever. I mean, any way you want, really. And I can bring in all of the other files as well. You know, if you have a Pro Tools file. Actually, one of the new cool things with the Fairlight is version 4 that's coming out soon. There, because now the Pro Tools has changed, so you can actually do things with it. Sorry. Um, <laughs> version 4 is going to allow you to simultaneously run Pro Tools and the Dream DAW on a PC at the same time and send signals back and forth. So I can have David's Pro Tools session running in Pro Tools on my system and have that feeding into my Fairlight through an input, and then I can run both simultaneously, and it'll control the transport. What about Sony? Uh, Sony does AAF. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they do not do, unfortunately, OMF as of yet. I've been talking with their software development team. God, guys, OMF. But for my internal purposes, uh, I'm doing sound effect creation, sound design. Uh, if I do, you know, sound for picture, I can. It's easy for me to pass back AF files mm -hmm. uh, and work that way. So, yeah. So, we have we have kind of coming down into conclusion. I wanted to, to showcase a little bit more of, of of Capital Audio Post. We're looking at one of your your VO recording rooms. Um, I mean, you're. I think one of the great things about Capital Audio Post is you have very, very traditional clients because you're, you're dealing with broadcast. I mean, when we get into to features, every feature is different. Um, you know, there might be months that you get to work on a project with some of the bigger films that, that David does. I know Colin and I have co collaborated on projects where we have two to three weeks, but you're coming in Monday through Friday, multiple shows coming through, very, very traditional clients that want all of the things that, that broadcasters need, but I think you do it in a very unconventional way um, and, and and allow, you know, a really fast workflow. So I just wanted to see if you could kind of elaborate how you start a project, how it comes out of your facility and how you're able to do that so quickly. Um, well, every project's different, just like every film is different. Um, so we'll have a different, you know, way of attacking it. Um, but a typical quick turnaround is we'll get the OMF or AAF and a QuickTime video reference. And we pop that in, let's say, uh, the DC Cupcakes for TLC, which is a reality show, and it's fairly simple. It'll be a three-day turnaround. So on the first day, I'll go through and fix music edits that the video editors did, and uh, my partner Chip will be doing all of his track organizing, and he's going through all the mics and picking out the mics that he wants if there's anything that needs to be cleaned up, he'll shoot it over to me. I'll pop it into Isotope RX2, clean that up. And then I'll lay in some ambiences. He'll do all the jingly, you know, twinkly sounds that they use in that show, add all those in, mix day two, approve day three, deliver. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it is. But, you know, Chip and I have worked together for about seven years. And so we've developed... Uh, you know, a very easy relationship of working back and forth. And so we know, okay, oh, here comes a uh, bomb patrol. So we know, well, I'll do all the trucks and I'll do the music. He'll do the dialogue. He'll do the guns and whatever. And, and so we can, it's already there. It's like a, a template in our brains of who's doing what. So for, for our, our students sitting in here today who will, will be graduating and, and wanting to, to, you know, intern at facilities like yours, I mean, how, how do you want them to come into your environment and how do they, you know, do you, you hope to, for them to understand and kind of pick up on this kind of internal template and this very fast-paced workflow? Like, what's, what's your goal? What, what are your hopes when a, a new intern comes into your facility? We look for, and, and we do bring in interns, um, we look for people with drive, people who can communicate, will show up on time, and work hard. Other than that, you can be taught the rest. So as far as you know, working into that workflow that we have, it's just it comes with time from being there. Now, one of the things that we're doing at our new facility that we didn't have the advantage of doing at our old employer is we're building, it should be done when I get back, a third mix room that's stereo only, but there's only two of us. Mm -hmm. So if we have an intern and they don't have something to do, then they can just go into the third room and sit there and learn and then pop over and ask us questions. And we'll be like, oh, here's some VO, go edit the VO and get your chops up, you know? So we're looking for people who want to learn mm -hmm. and we want to teach them and we're willing to go, here you go, here's a whole room to yourself, do it. So Rick, I know you have a very interesting internship program and a, a very unique way of, of how you, you bring on new interns. I wanted to know if you would talk a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, when we do internships, we actually call them seasons because we document everything we do and we put it on uh, YouTube and uh, we have we call it the Chop Shop Video Diaries and they're pretty fun and exciting. Um, basically what we do is we do, uh, I guess, a casting call. And I'm like, hey, we're doing an internship. For example, we are doing an internship uh, late spring, early summer. And the problem with internships that I've had, and I think you might have talked about this yesterday, is everybody sends in resumes 
guess what, guys? I know what your guys' resumes are going to look like because they're going to look like everybody else's resumes. The only difference between your resume and your resume is going to be the name at the top. You're going to name all the gear and you're going to name the films and all this kind of stuff. That doesn't tell me anything about it. I have no idea what your personality is. I have no idea what your passion is. I'm looking for one word, man. I'm looking for otaku. I'm looking for passion. Because at the end of the day, you can teach a monkey to press a button, especially when you're recording. It's the red one. You just done. Um, and it doesn't take any brains to go, well, we're going to point the mic in the general direction of the sound. That stuff we could teach you. We can teach you Pro Tools. These guys can. Uh, or we can teach you how to cut a sound and all this kind of stuff. Um, but I can't teach you passion. I can't give you passion. You have to have passion. You have to bring the passion yourself. Um, so I, I've had too many internships where it was just a waste of my time. The kids were just, they thought that this was an extension of school. And if they just kind of showed up for three months that somehow magically it was going to get them to the next step. I'm like, man, that's not what I'm, I don't need that kind of people around me. I want to, I like to have fun. I like to enjoy what I'm doing. And I want to have people around me that have the same passion that I have. So what I do, if you want to intern for me, is you send me a 60 second video. Pop it up on Facebook or YouTube or something. It uh, doesn't have to be polished. You can do it with your iPhone. I could care less. I just want to hear your voice, and I want to see you, and I would look in your eyes, and, and for you to explain and tell me, this is what I want. This is why, I, you know, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life, and you know, I want to see the passion. And when I see that otaku, that's, that's the defining the moment for me on whether or not I want to bring somebody in to, for even an interview at that point. Now, David, you're, you work on a lot of high-profile films where, or in some cases, no one can be in the, in the, in the room with you when, when you're looking at a picture and when you're doing your work. Uh, can you take on interns or apprentice? And if so, how do you do that? I, I've never been able to do that. Uh, uh, there's a couple of reasons. One is I work out of my house, and my wife wouldn't like that very much. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the other reason is because of non-disclosure agreements, usually. And, uh, and you know, I have, to sign them, I have to sign them myself. And then... Uh, uh, that's a big trick when you're working at home is trying to get films to send you picture because they're super paranoid about picture getting leaked. They always want to know what my protection scheme is, you know, and how I'm protecting their picture. And they always embed my name in the in the in the in the video, so if it ever gets out, it's clear that it came from me. Um, so you know, I'm, there's several reasons why I haven't been able to do that. I sort of I wish I have because I get I get lots of emails from people that would like to to intern with me, and I wish I could, because I'd, I'd love to have somebody around, I'd love to be able to bounce ideas off of them. I think it's, you know, working at home, does your, does your wife have to sign the NDA as well? Or do they no, she doesn't. <laughs> I think everybody, I don't, I don't think the clients know that I'm married. <laughs> um, but we're seeing uh, a, a lot of trends, uh, at least in, in Hollywood, that there's a lot of editors working at home. We have an internship program uh, on the dub stage, uh, if you're a graduate of, of film or recording arts, um, we've, we've talked to a couple of show production uh, grads, but we haven't hired our first show pro intern. Um, not necessarily a big need of, of, of Pro Tools knowledge, because we, we can show you Pro Tools. And um, we try to you know, emulate um, my, my mixing partner, Dave Camella, um, worked in New York for most of his career before coming to Full Sail. I worked in Los Angeles. So we try to come up with, you know, he will showcase to our interns what it's like to work in New York, and I'll do the same with, with Los Angeles. But most of the interns that have left us and are working in Los Angeles, we have Kelly Vockel, who's a Full Sail graduate. Uh, she cuts dialogue out of her, out of her house. Um, uh, Joy uh, is, is doing a little bit of work um, at Margarita Mix, but she's starting to edit and work at things at home. So the laptops that you guys have as you start the program here at Full Sail, if you have Pro Tools on it, um, you can get, um, I think, the Sony, is Sony available on the Mac? Yeah, Sound Forge is. You can also get the, um, like, Parallels, Parallels or, like, some or kind of a virtual VMware. machine, yeah. Um, but the, the idea is, is having this, this, you know, studio at home and being able to work on this stuff at home is extremely, extremely valuable because when you are in a facility like Frank's and you happen to have Pro Tools, if there was a project that came in as Pro Tools that wasn't an AAF and you could say, hey, let me load up the Pro Tools project, let me export it as an AAF for you so that you can get back into working, that might be your first step into you know, getting him to appreciate you there as an intern and maybe put you onto more projects. But you, you, know, you don't just have these laptops you know, for, for Facebook or YouTube, things like that. There's these, you know, these software and stuff 
Um, and, the, and the goal of today's panel is hopefully to just kind of open your minds up a little bit to, to know that you can use these right away. You can start making projects you know, immediately. And however you get picture, however you get the sounds into the system, just start editing and start putting it together. Is there any uh, like final comments that, that any of you would like to impart to our students here today? Yeah, I, I would say don't obsess about the gear. Because I know, I know lots of people that are purists. I, I, knew, I knew a guy once way back when, do we have to stop this in seven seconds? Okay, um, I'm just watching the counter back there. Um, I, I knew a guy that, that, that was absolutely such a purist that he would not do a sample rate conversion on a file. He would take a DAT machine to go from 48K to 44.1 and analog go out and to, to a new DAT machine. So that's, that's sort of the deep end of, of uh, uh, purism. I'm definitely not a purist. You can tell by the fact that I'll stick a, a line in a, in a movie that's been shot on a camera. I'm not a purist. Um, doesn't mean I'm not a perfectionist, but uh, I'm not a purist as far as gear goes. And I have, I have one example I'd kind of like to impart, I guess. Um, when I was first at EFX in Burbank, we were working on gear that wasn't the best. It was old MCI consoles and noisy patches and all this stuff. And we were all obsessed with all the top people in the top studios. And we, we hired a guy that was at one of these top studios. I'm not going to name him. I'm not, I'm not even sure if he's working anymore still. but. He was very well known and had the, had a $100,000 room, and at the time that was, you know, a, a very expensive room. And we got the we got the material back from him, and it was it was not good. It was not it was not really usable design material. And it was that was when it dawned on me that the gear doesn't make the sound. It's the it's the person that makes the sound. And what I was trying to show earlier today was some of the some of the basic tools that are very very good. I'm actually really envious of all you guys that that you're in, entering the the workforce with this sort of quality tools at your fingertips for this amount of money. It's insane, you know, what what you can actually do with with on a student's budget with these sort of tools. So just don't obsess about all the all the gear because that's not going that doesn't in, in itself make the sound. Anyone else? Um, the other thing that I think is really important. Um, a lot of people are really worried about, oh, I don't have a project to work on. I don't, you know, the projects that are being offered to me aren't really great. <clears throat> you can have all the knowledge in the world, and, and, but nothing beats the experience. Um, just, just get out there and work. If you don't have a project to work on, make one. That's actually the, the way that I got into sound effects. I couldn't find any uh, projects as a student to work on, so I said, well, I'll just make sound effects because nothing else to do. Um, so um, just, just do work. And that'll be probably your biggest tool. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree basically with with what they said 100%. Um, I would also say that uh, experiment as much as you can. Um, just because he did it, uh, you know, this way or he did it that way or I did it, a certain, doesn't mean that's the best way to do it. That's just the way that we figured it out doing it. So uh, don't don't pigeonhole yourself into a, a certain line of thinking. Um, Experiment, experiment, experiment. Try something different. Try different mic placement. Try bouncing different sounds together. Just keep experimenting. Yeah. Just one quick thing. Um, while you're here, network with the other students in the other programs because it will help you to learn how to communicate with them when you get out into the workforce. And you can learn something from them about their side of it. So if you know a little bit about film or video, it will help you if you're doing sound design for video or film. If you know a little bit about computer games, it'll help you do the sound design for the games or whatever. Well, great insight today. This concludes our panel on audio post-production for television and film. I'd like to thank David, Colin, Rick, and Frank. Uh, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you.